Welcome to another episode of Dead Headspace. I'm your host, Patrick R. McDonough, joined by my friend, Brennan LaFaro. Say hello, Brennan. Hello, everybody. And our other friend joins us today, Candice Nola. Say hello, Candice. Hello. And we're talking with uh, Stacey Lane Wilson. Say hello, Stacey. Hi. Brennan, take us away. So, Stacey, we want to kind of start off because you got your start writing very, very young. And I'd like to know kind of how you got into that. Well, my mom was a writer. So when I was a little kid, she would be typing away on her actual typewriter, the IBM. Uh, So I just remember that. And I wanted to be like my mom. So I would write in my little uh, writing tablet horse stories because I loved horses and I had a pony. So I would write stories and illustrate them myself. So it was something that I always wanted to do. And that's how I got into it. And then you wound up writing uh, horse stories for, uh, you know, on a national level. Tell us a little bit about that, because that's that's you at 12, right? (laughs) Right. Yeah. Uh, I submitted a story about me and my pony to a magazine and they really liked it and they ran the story. And then I just kept submitting articles and then I submitted to other magazines and they took them and my mom helped me. You know, she taught me how to type and uh, proofread things for me and sent them in and it was really encouraging when they got published. So of course I kept wanting more and more seeing my name in print and it just kept going from there. That's awesome. Now at, at what point did you start? All right, so, so, so we're, we're on horses. How do we get to horror? What got you into horror? <laughs> I'm in the, this portion of the alphabet, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I also liked horror. I think all little kids love to be scared. You know, it's kind of a, a, a safe way to experience that through movies or TV shows. Um, when I was really young, I had two kind of opposite experiences with my parents because they were divorced. So I remember um, when I was a little kid, one night my dad let me stay up really late to watch a Roger Corman movie, The Pit and the Pendulum with, um, uh, was it Vincent Price? Yeah, I think it's Vincent Price was in that. So it's kind of a tame, fun little horror flick. And then my mom took me to see The Exorcist at about that same age. And I was like scared the bejesus out of me. Uh, so it's two kind of opposite ends of the horror spectrum, but I love them both. And I just um, never stopped liking horror. So when I was a kid, I would read everything from um, little slightly scary books to full on Stephen King, my mom's library. She let me read everything in there. So I read all kinds of books from a very young age. I feel like right now is a good time for Candace to jump in specifically for Edgar Allan Poe. She's I can't help it now. Whenever I, whenever a Poe comes up my mind, just there she is Candace. So Candace take us away. Well, I mean, I'm just a fan of Edgar Allan Poe. So, you know, if you're um, the one film that you watch, the the Vincent Price one was an Edgar Allan Poe um, story. Did you read a lot of Poe after that experience? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I got into him. Actually, the first time I remember liking an Edgar Allan Poe story was, uh, you know, not not exactly a campfire, but a slumber party with me and my friends. And we all read the telltale heart. (laughs) So and we were all kind of spooked and it was fun. I loved it. And so, yes, I read a lot of those. And then I also read some biographies about him. I just found Mm -hmm. him such a fascinating character. And my first film that I ever directed was actually based on an Edgar Allan Poe poem. Which was? Uh, Annabelle Lee, and it stars uh, Ogre from Skinny Puppy as the Edgar Allan nice. character. That's, yeah. that's awesome. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. have, have you guys read Eureka? Uh, his, he's like a prose poem. Dives into outer space. Yeah. I, I'm uh, always... no, I haven't read that one. I, I know we're focusing on Stacy, but can you just can't decide? Very few people that I talked to have read that. Can you can you tell me what you thought of it? Um, it's probably 
in my top 10 of his that I most like. Hmm. And it's really not like the rest of the, it's not like his other works. Definitely. Which is, I think, is why it stood out. But it's odd that you mentioned it because not a lot of people know about it at he all. Wrote, I think he got published posthumous, posthumously. Yeah. And there was a lot of deb- debate about uh, like like the outer space at that time because mm-hmm. it, he said a lot of things that contradicted con- uh, conventional thinking back then. And turns out he was spot on with a lot of things, which right. my take is that what we do, fiction writing, it's really important. It shapes this world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it can be predictive. Um, did yeah. you any of you see the Jeffrey Combs one man um, show of Edgar Allan Poe? Ooh, no. Oh, it was amazing. He toured the country it. with it, and it was really stunning. And he, he did also play him in an episode of Masters of Horror, though. Mm. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah, I'll have to check it. Check it out. <laughs> Um, But aside from Edgar Allan Poe and going back to your writing and your very extensive background in music, when did you get the the idea to merge the music with the horror, like your rock and roll nightmares that you do? Uh, Well, it... I should have done it a lot sooner, I think, because I feel like I've hit sort of the magic formula for me, something that I enjoy doing and that sells well. It's really more, the nonfiction has actually sort of been like the the golden ticket, you could say, and the mm-hmm. fiction is kind of a, a portion of that. But um, yeah, I I guess you could say I've always liked the two things, but I never really... Um, thought about marrying them together until I guess the pandemic kind of gave me a lot of time to think and to write and uh, that's how it all came together I really like that a lot and every story that I have read has been just spot on and it's just like (laughs) they take you right into that time frame you can hear it you can see it it's just like they're just so spot on if you haven't read them you guys need to because <laughs> they're so great. Yeah, I've really gotten some great authors to uh, oh, contribute yeah. to the, yeah. the fiction ones. And um, yeah, I'd like to point out, though, that I do pay the authors. So <laughs> I know there's been a lot of debate about that lately on <laughs> Facebook. Yes, pay the writer. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> um, I pay mine as well. So. Yes. <laughs> But yeah, no, I've definitely uh, just really picked writers that know their music and their horror. And to me, Mm -hmm. um, an element of dark comedy is also important. I think also in the nonfiction. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it is. As far as nonfiction goes, and this isn't, I mean, I told you this yesterday, but I, I want to encourage potential readers for this. Rock and Roll Nightmares, True Stories, Volume 2 is the book that um i've read and it (laughs) for me it came at a time when like i needed something to kind of pull me out of what i normally read to just get me back in like a happy fun loving place and and that did it for me and it's weird to say that because it is about true crime but um i have a huge soft spot for like you stacy rock and roll my dad used to play on his stereo when i was growing up um the stereo system. I remember Boston. Uh, their their debut album was a big one, but he play all the all the classics, and um, that's what it took me back to. Uh, that's why I fell in love with Zeppelin as a kid because of my my father. And um, I mean, from again, I'm repeating this to you, but I think that's the greatest thing that a writer could do is even if it's super gruesome like jack ketchum gruesome or at least stuff whatever it is uh if you can take the person out of their element or their world for just a little bit 
I think you've done a great job and that's what you've done. So that's my, that was my introduction, introduction to your writing. Um, so it's only going to go higher from there. I hope oh, no pressure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure at all. Yeah. No, I have a lot of, uh, rock and roll nightmares books planned for the future. Mm -hmm. And, um, so it's, it's definitely a series that's going to keep on going um, it, in different facets, too. It's also a brand, you know, where it's different things. Um, the very latest Rock and Roll Nightmares book is called Rock Tales. And it's um, rock. It, it's like rock musicians giving me their recipes for their favorite cocktails and mocktails. And it's fully illustrated with pictures and um, it's funny and it's, but it's also real recipes and it benefits the Sweet Relief Musicians Fund. So it goes to charity. Oh, okay. um, yeah, I have actually a copy of it right here that I can show you. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. So Fantastic. it's got, um, yeah, it's got members of Steely Dan, um, Ice Nine Kills, Quiet Riot, Vixen, Guar, Strawberry Alarm Clock, Keel, like a bunch of bands that gave me recipes. Let's see if I can find a good picture here. So, um, while you're yeah, looking, yeah, while you're looking, just another pitch for potential readers is, oh, that's cool. Yeah, is the way that you oh. mix so many, so many different bands, so many different moments from. Uh, in volume two from like like I said Led Zeppelin mentions of the Who mentions of the big bands from the British uh, invasion um, you just it's it's so I want to say weird but that's not the right word because <laughs> it's eclectic you it, but you eclectic, do it yeah. so it's so seamless and it's yeah. not clunky at any point and I, I genuinely think that that can only be done by a uh by a seasoned writer that knows what they're doing. Um, well, it also comes from a place of genuine affection. It's not something that I'm trying to force because I love all that music. You know, I mean, yeah. Gordon Lightfoot, uh, rest in yeah, peace. Yeah. He just yeah. died a few days ago. I mean, I love him as much as I love Metallica. So like my, my uh, music knowledge and love is spreads far and wide. So, and I think that shows in the writing and just my... Oh, yeah you know, enjoy of doing the research and all that. I got one qu one more question that I'm dying to ask. And then Brennan or Candace, whoever wants it. Uh, Robert Johnson. I'm fascinated by him. I've recently read uh, titles escaping me right now, but it's, it's, I, I looked into like, what's the best bio to biography to read by him uh, of him. Um, and it goes really into the, who the man was not like the, the, like, the lore of this is why I think he died and he went to the crossroads, made the deal. You know, it went into mm -hmm. who he was. It was really interesting. I'm wondering if you're going to tackle him more in depth, because at least in volume two, you, you mentioned him, but, and I know it was for a certain time period and he's, he's in the thirties. Are you going to go back to, because rock and roll has obviously heavy, uh, obviously heavy African-American and blues uh, roots. So I'm wondering if you're going to go back into the thirties with the blues, maybe even some of the jazz scene in the forties. Yeah. Yeah. I might do that. Um, I'm tackling several different subjects. And like I said, I have at least seven books planned. Um, Holy shit. The, I know. Oh yeah. God. Yeah. There are so many different subjects that to cover um, definitely want to go into I want to go into lore, which I think is interesting. Um, a lot of haunted kind of recording studios, haunted nightclubs, nightclubs where murders have taken place, um, songs that have been written about real murders or the story behind the song of someone who died and really go in depth into that. Um, so I'm not really planning on writing books about a certain person like I wouldn't write a whole biography on one person probably because the, the whole idea of the book is to um, combine a lot of different people into a topic mm. Brennan all right so I when I looked at your work I, I had another book come to mind um this book, Atomic Love by Jesse Rose. I don't know if anybody's here has read it, but it, 
she sent it to me a couple of years ago and when I was, you know, solely really taken on horror books for review and it's a heavy metal memoir and it absolutely sucked me in. Cause it's, it, it's a book about, you know, uh, a, a woman who marries this kind of troubled musician, but it's, and it, and it's kind of like a fake memoir, but it's horror it, oh, okay. it it's 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 got these terrible you know just the the worst possible things all rooted in humanity and even though it doesn't delve into the supernatural it absolutely com- uh you know contains facets of horror so my question for you is in your opinion what are some of the most intriguing i guess um parallels between music and horror whether it's rock and roll or really anything um i think that the the theatricality of it the fact that you can be another person a character you can be um like say alice cooper or somebody like that who's donning a persona and acting like they're a horror figure, but they're someone else. They're actually a really nice guy. And that's, I think a lot of people think that horror writers or people in the horror field, horror directors are really bloodthirsty and ghoulish and they're not like that at all. Do you think that like a part of that, you know, you, you, you always hear about, you know, maybe it's maybe, maybe horror writers are the nicest people on earth because they get it all out in a healthy <laughs> way. Do you think the same is true Possibly, for musicians? Yeah. <laughs> Um, (laughs) alice cooper and i only know this because my son is he was two at the time uh there's a kid show called bubble guppies and alice cooper played the voice i think it was a pirate but he was in he at least voiced uh one children's episode and and that's pretty cool because i did not expect that yeah, there's a lot of unexpected facets to Alice Cooper's personality. Like, well, he, he used to drink a lot, but now he's he doesn't drink at all. And he's very religious. He plays golf. <laughs> you know, it's like things that you may not expect. Actually, his daughter gave me a cocktail, Calico Cooper, for the Rock Tales book. Cool. Yeah, yeah. It's really fun. So you've had a lot of conversations with a lot of people music um is there an an experience a moment that just really stands out with you more than anyone else that you really just did not expect with anyone that you've met Hmm. well I have interviewed thousands of people literally because when I used to work for sci-fi channel and horror.com you know I was a red carpet reporter and I interviewed Mm -hmm. thousands of people everyone from Robin Williams to Brad Pitt to Julia Roberts to you know you name it I probably interviewed them (laughs) so but I didn't get a chance to interview as many musicians as I would have liked because I mainly covered films but I did get to interview Rob Zombie a number of times because he directed movies or I got to interview musicians in connection with them being on a soundtrack or something Mm -hmm. like that um but I mean moment but like Personally, for me, getting to interview mm-hmm. Jimmy Page was a really great experience because I was a huge fan of his ever since I was a kid. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, he was in a movie, uh, a documentary called It Might Get Loud with Jack White. So that was, you know, just for me personally, it was exciting. But I have to say one of the most unusual or strange experiences would have been um, interviewing Marilyn Manson. Yeah. And yeah, it was <laughs> surreal in many ways. But one of the more, more uh, I guess, things that was a little disconcerting is like, which eye do you look into? Because he had that one milky contact lens and the other eye was going this way. <laughs> it was just really kind of weird. Was he nice? Yeah. Yeah, he was. He seemed nice enough. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, Twiggy Ramirez was there next to him, and I, Dita Montes, he was dating her at one of the times that I interviewed him. So, I mean, I interviewed him a number of times, but mm-hmm. I think the first time I interviewed him, it was just like a little weird, like because his eyes were just so bizarre, and it was kind of surreal. Like I said, what was it like talking to Rob Zombie? He's um, 
sure yeah. you know, but he's from he's from Burning in Mind, neck of the woods, uh, Averill, Massachusetts. Yeah. And uh I mean the Devil's Rejects for me is one of my favorite movies. It's just, me it's, too. I love it, that movie. And he's it, such a you know, so deliberate with his music choices and he that movie actually introduced me to a lot of music. I really didn't wasn't too aware of Terry Reed before that soundtrack and have been a huge fan ever since. Um, I've interviewed him so many times, but uh, every time he's just been very down to earth, matter of fact, um, straightforward. Yeah, I wouldn't say he's not like super warm and fuzzy. He doesn't come running up and give you a hug, but he's not very aloof either. He's just a normal, straightforward guy. Nice. Kind of very knowledgeable. Like, he seems like he, I don't know if uh, as a, uh, hardcore as Stanley Kubrick, but he does seem like he takes a Kubrick approach with film, meaning, like you said, very deliberate. But it, it's obviously I've never been on a set, but it seems like he would be be very. This is the way we shoot it. It's his vision, and that's. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but do you kind of get that impression with him? Um, mm, well, I've been on set uh, to observe filming of a couple of his movies, and you never know if someone's acting different when the press is there, but. Um, you know, I never saw him yelling and screaming at the cast or the oh, no, 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 like definitely that. didn't mean it like that. <laughs> no, um, Candace, do you have any other questions? I didn't know if I interrupted. No, I have other questions, but nothing that you interrupt. <laughs> I was gonna let you or Brett run in and talk. <laughs> I definitely want to dive into your uh, your movie career and. Mm-hmm. I would love to know maybe what got you started into it, but more so where you see yourself or hope to see your career grow, um, where you want to see it end up going. Like Uh, what what would be a dream position? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not really a kind of person that has an end game. I'm not, um, I like to go with the flow and I like to do whatever interests me creatively at the moment. Um, I'm really not, I'm kind of, I have a few co- things coming in terms of film, but I'm really more of a writer and I've always been a writer and that's my passion. So I'm really more excited about the Rock and Roll Nightmares book series than anything, but I have teamed up with a producer who is shopping it to some um, some financiers to try to get either a series like a a fictional scripted series like black mirror the twilight zone oh my god yeah that would be fun right or (laughs) um or possibly a true crime type series like behind the music so it could go a lot of different ways and that would be great i'd love to get involved with something like that um but yeah i have a couple more things coming up something that i shot a couple of years ago called night of the mannequins and um it's a it's it's a horror comedy and it's very surreal. I haven't seen the final cut yet, so I can't talk too much about it yet, but I'm excited about that. It's uh, I would say it's a combination of tourist trap and the panic room. <laughs> it's, it's wild. And then I have uh, a couple of little short things coming up, but um, my latest film was The Second Age of Aquarius, which is a uh, sci-fi rock and roll comedy, and that's one of my favorite things that I've done, and that was came out last year. Very cool. Brennan? So I want to take us back to writing a little bit. Now, with the um, rock and roll nightmares, the true stories, you know, you, you said that nonfiction is kind of... Um, what, well, I'm paraphrasing, but what pays the bills? So I yeah. wonder what, um, what, how does your approach differ when you're writing nonfiction versus fiction? Well, I mean, obviously, you have to stick to the facts. You have to be careful that you're fact checking, and but I, I don't find it any less creative. I do enjoy still being able to write with flair if I can. Um, and to be able to tell a story. I mean, it, it's still the same sort of set of, of uh, sort of, you know, what I guess what you do in terms of writing, you know, when you start just tell a story, you want to make sure that you know where it's going. So that's 
that's kind of how I approach both things. But with writing fiction, there's a lot more leeway. Of course, you can blame a lot of things on ghosts or supernatural <laughs> occurrences. So with, uh, with nonfiction, you have to kind of stay within reality. Now, like r- rock and roll is such a fast paced, you know, every, every aspect seems like it's, it's going to be interesting. Do you ever find that when you're writing nonfiction in that, you know, regard that you do have to trim stuff out in order to, you know, get the best of the story and keep the pacing good? Or does it really, does everything have a place? Uh, It all seems to kind of fall into place. When I'm doing my research, I usually pick out some of the things that I find the most interesting. I always feel like as a writer, you have to write what you yourself would want to read. You really can't Mm. try to anticipate the market. You know, I mean, that that's kind of a fool's errand. Yeah. Agreed. Candace, throwing it to you. Throwing it to me. So, okay. I have a few. So, which I think you might have just answered this one, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Do you prefer one over the other, the nonfiction versus the fit, fit, fiction, or are they both, you know, just as nice to, to write, I guess? Uh, you know, it kind of depends on the frame of mind that I'm in. I do find fiction a little more difficult. Um, because I actually have to think everything up myself <laughs> when it comes to nonfiction. It's like, okay, the facts are there. Now I just put them together in my own creative way. Yeah. Um, okay. So when you are in, when you're involved in a nonfiction story, I suppose, uh, can you walk us through what your approach is? Everything from how you would start to do your research and the outline till it's out and done. What does well, that look like? Yeah, well, uh, it it can look a bit chaotic to others, <laughs> but it makes sense to me. Uh, yeah, well, the research, of course, is what takes the longest time. Mm-hmm. Um, I usually just kind of, do a broad strokes research online, dig a little deeper. Maybe I'll go to the Wayback Machine for things that are no longer readily accessible. So this is Mm -hmm. websites that are no longer online. Find some stuff there. Of course, taking notes as to where I found everything because I want to make sure that everything is traceable. Then I will see if there are any books that I can read and there's documentaries. So there's a lot of different things you can look at Uh, for research Mm -hmm. and so then I would cut and paste all that stuff and then I would go through it and and then rewrite it in my way and then I would go through it again so that nothing uh, exists of the original text and then go through it once more and so that it's just is all my writing except for the quotes And then I go through it again. Yeah. And then I I usually have a couple of readers that go through it too, to make sure that everything makes sense. Because, you know, when you're reading your own writing, it all makes sense to you. And then you have to kind of make sure that outside, (laughs) outside eyes can also read it and take it in and make sense of it all. So I've definitely kind of assumed that, you know, oh, everybody knows this. And then I've had my proofreader go through it or my friend read it and say, wait, what, what does that mean? What did she say? So I, that's how I do it. Okay. So when you are involved in a fictional story, do you sort of go with the flow or do you outline everything? No, I don't outline. I've tried that so many times and I, it just seems to be a waste of time because when I start writing, it just kind of, it's almost like automatic writing. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. it's just kind of the story takes over. And I've had, you know, sometimes things just surprise me, the turns that a story can take. And it mm-hmm. was even that I didn't expect to happen. So that's the fun of it. Same here. Same yeah. here. I don't outline anything. I just, <laughs> it, just, it just goes. <laughs> it goes. We don't Brennan or 
Patrick. Yeah, I was gonna say she's a machine. Yeah. Which one a, of us? Well, okay, that's fair. So both of you are actually. <laughs> yeah. You're both very prolific. Very prolific. So, <laughs> yeah. Not the wood, you owe me a cook. But um, I do have a question. So I think it's worth for listeners that you know have been with us for a while. Uh, the first episode of ours that you watched was the one with David J. Scow, and in that. That's interesting because Candace is she's like we're me, Brennan, her, and one more Erica Robin. We're like a big family now over the last year, and uh, it's really funny that that was the first one you were introduced to because Candace is here and you already knew her. And <laughs> yeah, I yeah, wouldn't... I've known David for years and years and years. Um, yeah, he's he's really one of a kind. He is, and I was just going to ask what what can you tell people that may not know who he is what your experience with him is because we all just adore that guy he's hilarious very knowledgeable <laughs> he is he's and very, he wrote he's, the fucking crow <laughs> he did i mean that's what i was gonna say like that was probably my first introduction to him um yeah, yeah i also love his book uh black leather required it's a great one uh he's just done so many things that i uh, you know you can't possibly pinpoint it all he wrote one book fairly recently and I gosh it's the name is kind of escaping me but it's a, a noir you know he can just write in so many different styles he's so versatile his depth of knowledge of writing and writers throughout the decades from gosh I mean you know from Lovecraft on up it's just uh mind-boggling he's really a walking encyclopedia but he's He's also not the kind of person who's a braggart. You know, he's not up there like shouting everything that he knows. And he's really not online that much. He's barely on social media. I don't even know if he still has any social media accounts. So it's kind of a, you kind of have to get to know him. He's kind of quiet. But then, you know, when you do, you, you learn how, um, just how much there is to him. Absolutely. Um yeah, he. I know he has Facebook again. He made a new profile. He said he got banned before. <laughs> He's <laughs> on Twitter. Sounds about right. <laughs> Twitter. <laughs> he. Um. I'm bringing this up because you were talking about his range of of uh of stories, and for my debut edited anthology, I got him a re uh, a reissue of one of his stories from the late '80s. I forget the anthology that was in, but it's called um, Sedalia. It's, it's basically about poltergeist dinosaurs coming back to life and they are, you know, massive creatures. And it's just so funny because he's writing about how they're destructive, but they're not doing it because they're assholes. They're just like a big brontosaurus is coming back to life and it's fucking huge. So when it becomes a physical form, it's going to crush things and people are going to die. Yeah. <laughs> and how he writes that is so unique. And another thing worth pointing out is he he's got I think two, maybe three episodes in the new uh version of Creep Show. He does, and yeah. And he, he also write... wrote um uh, one at least one of the masters of horror. Yeah, he can mm -hmm. write some sick shit, but he's so goddamn funny. <laughs> he's <laughs> yeah. hilarious. Um and it was really neat when he came on how he praised uh, Candace. I know you're going to be shy about this, but uh, for winning the Splatterpunk Award and rightfully so. That's really neat. It, that That's something that I love about him and a lot of, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A lot of veterans in the writing field that I, I personally talk to have a lot of things in common, but one being that they pay it forward, and David definitely does that. He doesn't shy away well, from I that. I loved your uh, your episode with Chuck Polinick too. He's one of my favorites. Oh, yeah. Um, I definitely didn't feel smart enough to talk to that man. <laughs> right. I know none <laughs> of us do. I know. I interviewed him, I think, in the 90s for the first time when he won. Was it 90s? He won the Stoker Award for Guts, and I interviewed him at Dark Delicacies Bookstore, and then I interviewed him again for Choke, the movie. Oh, version. man. Yeah. This is so, so um, yeah, so you know Del Housen, too, then. That's hilarious. Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, I had him, we had him on recently, but uh, yeah, with Chuck, um, it, you know, that was the first episode where literally my computer just stopped. 
Like it oh. went black it was screen. too smart even for your computer to handle. Yeah, and I said, Oh, this is cool. The first time I have like a writer of that esteem, and um I don't know if I have the episode saved. I did, but luckily he he said right away, he's like we can record this the next few days. And I'm, I'm bringing this up because it's really worth emphasizing how nice people, um, when they get to that level, how nice they are. You know, not everyone is, but like, it, it's really important um, that you don't let your ego get ahead of you. And, and I don't know, I just think of guys like that. Uh, and I'm really wondering your experience in the film world and music world. And can you kind of say, cause I, I don't, I'm only a fan. I don't really talk to many people in the music world or, or film world. Is it kind of like that too, that you've experienced? Uh, you know, it really varies from personality to personality. Um, yeah, it's, and it also kind of depends on what facet of the world that they're in. Um, usually producers are not nearly as friendly as directors or I've heard. <laughs> whatever reason funny i was watching a uh, red dragon the other day which oh. i hadn't seen so i know right um but i yeah. uh i was remembering that i did the press junket and how rude brett ratner was because he was just you know so full of himself and Ugh. just kept looking at his phone the whole practically the whole interview that's rude. um but then you know interviewing anthony hopkins who i think is much more of a you know, star than Brett Ratner. He was so friendly and, you know, just welcoming and kind. And so, yeah, it, it just really depends on the person. But also I do find that, you know, once people ha have reached, like you said, a certain echelon or maybe a certain age, they've kind of let go of all that and just kind of the vanity is not there anymore. Yeah. And, and, and like one of my favorite filmmakers and honestly, he's one of my two biggest writing influences since I've been a kid is, uh, uh, George Romero and Kevin Smith and and I've never met either one never talked to either one but I, I watch a bunch of interviews uh, I love documentaries and like no one's got a bad word about either guy Same yeah, yeah great guys mm -hmm. um Candace how about you take over because I'm just going to keep on talking about random shit Brandon had and Stacy won't ever come back again unless you're here <laughs> I'm good at random <laughs> I will be here all right, I, I I actually want to follow up on uh, a, a question that I believe that I read in an interview with Uncomfortably Dark, um, where you had said to newer writers that they should not give up and they should not read one star reviews. And I'm wondering if that's a rule that you set for yourself or and, and follow pretty well, or if that's something you learned the hard way. Oh, I don't know if I said don't read one star reviews. I don't think you can help it sometimes. <laughs> sometimes you, they just happen to pop into your eye. <laughs> you know, it's like, ah. Um, yeah, I don't know. There is a book called The Bulletproof Writer that I recommend to a lot of people that is kind of helps you navigate the minefields of being a writer. Um, but there are a lot of, uh, you know, helpful books on that. But I think, yeah, don't give up. Just keep going. Perseverance uh just wins the day you know it's like I guess I always think what if I would have given up two years ago you know before I started writing rock and roll nightmares or what if I would have given up 10 years ago before I directed my first short film or what if I you know you never know what's around the next corner so that's my advice yeah never give up my apologies if I uh, misquoted you. I thought I wrote it down <laughs> yeah. right, but I am Brendan, you're entirely fired. fallible at nine o'clock yeah, on no, Thursday. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, you know, <laughs> trolling Amazon, like scanning yeah. for the one star reviews or anything. But uh, no, sometimes you can't help but see them. But yeah, it's uh, I I don't really I don't go to Goodreads or anything. I hear that's not the most pleasant place <laughs> to read about yourself. That's the rumor. Candace, how about you? about me um okay so with the um you just mentioned that you have a lot more books planned in the rock and roll so can you tell us about them what you can share what you're willing to share like sure. what's next 
Yeah, I just don't know which one I want to write first. But <laughs> um, yeah, one is um, Death Notes. So that's going to be the stories behind songs about uh, people who actually died, whether it was through tragedy or suicide or memorial songs, something like that, you know, because there's songs about um, just all kinds of death. So mm -hmm. I'm going to write a book about that. I'm going to write a book about uh, love gone wrong. It was going to be one book, but then I thought there's so many uh, breakups in uh, rock and so <laughs> many tragic love stories that I think I'll do 60s, 70s, 80s, and then beyond. So that might be four books. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I want to do one on um, killer nightclubs. So nightclubs where tragedies have happened or, you know, uh, shootings. There's so many stories like that, especially in New York and yeah. L.A., or um, mm. nightclubs that have been owned by the mob, um, mm -hmm. things like that. So There's yeah, we're, but where rock bands have played, so it has yeah. to tie into the rock theme. Right. Um, yeah, conspiracy theories. There's a lot of those that can be covered, um, and then ghost stories. There are so many musicians that have talked about seeing ghosts or been uh, in in a haunted recording studio or seen their departed bandmates so that could be another one so there's quite a few are nice. you gonna tackle river phoenix pardon you were talking about uh death, nightclubs and deaths um uh, and i thought about river phoenix oh yeah definitely the viper room yeah 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 i recently watched a documentary about that i honestly had, I, like i love johnny depp but i had no idea about any of that until I watch this and that is fascinating stuff. It, it really is. You know, I um, interviewed Anton Yelchin there about mm. the green room, which is also like a punk rock kind of a horror movie. Mm. And then he just, he died like a few months later in that horrible accident. Mm. So it's got like a lot of dark history to it. That's where they had the press junket for the green room at the Viper room. And I think yeah. it's still owned by Johnny Depp. I'm not sure, but I think it is. And you want to talk about Hawnings. There's got to be some kind of like built up energy there. Oh, so yeah. I mean, Hollywood is probably one of the most haunted cities on Earth. Yeah, I would think so. Um, yeah. Candace or Brennan, do you have anything before we start uh, winding down? I'll take that as a no. Okay. <laughs> I was start? waiting to see if he had anything else. We we're going to see who, who's going to blink first. Actually, I'm, I'm going to throw one thing out. Um, Stacy, I wonder if you, you uh, want to pitch listeners at all on your Immortal Confession series. Vampires mm -hmm. and Rock and Roll is probably right up the alley of a lot of people listening to this. <laughs> it is. I mean, it's more horror light. So I don't know if that really fits your audience. But yeah, the Immortal <laughs> Confession series follows uh, two rock and roll vampires throughout time and history. And the first book takes place in Hollywood in 1971. And then it um, there's four books in all in the series. Um, one of them does take place in 1919, though, so that one doesn't really have any rock and roll in it. But it's a it's a haunted house story, and I I really wanted to tackle this because the the house is sentient, so it's kind of absorbed the souls of these women who were killed inside the walls of it. So it's kind of a fun one, and it, it's a little departure from the series, and it stands alone. And then the latest book in the series takes place on Halloween night, um, mostly in a uh, a radio station in 1978. So it's really fun. I made a Spotify playlist that goes with it. And um, it's just like, it's a really fun one. So I think if you're looking for a Halloween read, you should grab that and save it for October. Awesome. Facto. Stacey, what are you currently reading? What am I reading now? I am reading Sick House by Jeff Strand. Oh, <laughs> I love choice. Jeff. He's a super nice guy. Um, Candace, what are you currently reading? I am reading a uh, an arc right now. It's an antho called We're Here. It is an anthology of LGBTQ plus horror stories, 
authors and the like. It is a charity anthem that is coming out from Gloom House. So I'm reading that right now for a blurb. And so far it is fantastic. So. Nice. Uh, Brennan, what about you, buddy? I am reading Good Neighbors by Sarah Langan. Um, a little more than halfway through that. And it's really, I really like it. I really like it because it, it, it kind of dives into this like almost like perfect on the surface neighborhood politics, uh, you know, kind of cutthroat um, suburban atmosphere, like perfectly. Um, it's funny and terrifying all at the same time, um, it, which, you know, when you think of like suburban politics, it's ex exactly what you think it is. But um I'm really enjoying that. Um, I am also reading The Beautiful Thing That Awaits Us All by Laird Barron. Mm -hmm. um, and, oh man, when, when I read his short stuff, it just, it reminds me of like, I feel like he's just the Ramsey Campbell of like this side of the Atlantic Ocean. This is the, <laughs> the, the dreadful atmosphere that that guy can create in like the first page of a story is just, I, I can't think of another author that can really do that besides the two of them. Nice. Patrick, what about you? So I just started um, one that's completely unrelated to horror, but it's um, it's called War Trash by uh, Ha Jing, and it's basically a like fictional memoir about this, um, this Chinese man that is eventually drafted and goes to uh, the fight in the Korean War, and he's imprisoned by the United Nations, and um, I don't know what happens. I haven't really read much of it yet, but it's supposed to be a super good book it uh was a finalist for a pulitzer prize so that's uh it's probably probably worth it <laughs> um final thoughts stacy we'll start with you do you have any final thoughts final thought uh let's see hmm i think that everyone should read candace nola's books that's a good final thought <laughs> all right and we're done <laughs> <laughs> good night everyone <laughs> well thanks stacy um well likewise i guess i'm just gonna follow that with if you're not reading stacy lane wilson you need to be um read me too of course because she said so but now you have to read us both so you're welcome stacy it was so nice to be able to talk to you again. Yeah. So glad you were here. Your hair looks great. You look great. And I'm really like, I can't wait to read the next, all the next ones because everyone you just made, <laughs> yeah. like I'm, I'm all in, I, I'm all in for all of that. So. Uh, well, thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I just want to thank you too. And it was really fun reading your book and i can't wait to dive into the others and i really hope to get picked up for something as far as like an anthology or the black mirror thing because i want to watch that so bad right now. <laughs> wouldn't that be fun yeah i think it'd be great yeah everybody listening should read candace nola and stacy lane wilson there you go see Every i started something here didn't i, <laughs> I should have said there that damn it every everybody on here your hair looks wonderful um <laughs> even you patrick and um All two of them <laughs> uh stacy i absolutely love the idea of uh taking those rock and roll nightmares um and putting the themes to them like hauntings and things like that that seems like something that you could do for a long time and never run out of ideas and just keep them fresh and interesting for for years to come yeah that's absolutely. really excellent and i look forward to that thanks next episode is gonna be uh two of Holy shit, 203 with uh, Owen King. It's going to be with me, Owen. Candace Nilla, and Brian Lafaro. And we have one of a few book giveaways. We're going to have Chuck Wendig uh, signed copy of Wayward. If you want to know how to uh, be a part of that free giveaway, just check out the Twitter page the, uh, the day that this episode is released. 
Um, as always, you have many choices in podcasts. Thank you for picking us.